My heart was distressed Neath Jehovah's dread frown Oh, and low in the pit Where my sins dragged me down There I cried to the Lord From the deep miry clay Who tenderly brought me song of praise, hallelujah. He placed me upon that strong rock by his side. My steps were established in near alibi. No danger of fall. Here I remain, but stand by his grace. Amen. Oh, I gave Father who answered my prayer, I'll sing my new song, the glad story of love, then join in the chorus with the saints above. song of praise. Amen. Let's try that song. I'm walking in the resurrection. Amen. He brought me out so we could walk in the resurrection. I'm walking in the resurrection, walking in the body change. I'm walking with Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm walking in the resurrection, walking in the body change until Take the last step, Jesus did. Oh, I'm walking in the resurrection, walking in the body change. I'm walking with Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, I'm walking in the resurrection, walking in the body change. Take the last step, Enoch. Let's try that first verse. I was dead like Lazarus, but I heard the voice of Jesus cry out to me. And broke the seal and the 
stone was rolled away Now I'm walking in newness of life Praise the Lord Oh yes, I'm walking in the resurrection Walking in the body change I'm with Jesus Christ Oh yes, I'm walking in the resurrection Walking in the body change I take the last step Enoch did Verse 2 Quickening power is already in me And it will manifest itself But I must know the day that Recognize who I am and go through Amen. Go through that door. Oh, yes, I'm walking. I'm walking in the body change. I'm walking with Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm walking in that resurrection. Walking in the body change until take the last step. Jesus walking in the resurrection. Oh, yes, I'm walking. Amen. My provider, oh, you are more than enough for me, Jehovah Rapha. Oh, you're my healer, 
bless you all. Can you sing one more song? I have a father. I have a father. heads for a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, how that sends joy bells in our hearts to think that a great, almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent God holding the universe in the palm of his hand and you care about us. Lord, reading in your word last night to my daughters, I read there in Psalms where David stood amazed. He said, the thought, your thoughts towards me are more than the grains of sand upon the seashore. He said, I cannot I can't handle this. David was in shock and in awe. And Lord, to think that the same God that thought that about David thinks that about us. Lord, we're on your mind how that just makes us feel. Lord, let the world fall apart. Let the world go insane. But Lord, you're on, we are on your minds. We are in your heart. Lord, you've never taken your eyes off of us. You know right where we are. You know right where we're going. You know, like David said, if I make my my bed in hell, thou art there. Lord, you know where we go, you go with us. Lord, we so appreciate that. Lord, I appreciate those that have gathered tonight, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you would be blessed. Lord, would your people be helped. Lord, may all things be said and done tonight for your honor and for your glory. Lord, you know what we have need of. Lord, you know just the right vitamin, the right word, Lord, to give us strength for the journeys ahead and so that we can fulfill this great mystery, Lord, that you hid in these earthen vessels. Lord, we just ask that your presence would just be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. While you're standing, I'll have you take your Bibles. It's so good to be with you tonight. See y'all. See your faces. And, and uh, so I hope we just can have fellowship around the Word tonight. Is that okay? You know, it's almost, it's so much more fun if we're sitting around the kitchen table and we're drinking a cup of coffee and just having fellowship with each other, you know, because I can speak and then you can give me some feedback and all that kind of stuff. And so, but tonight we're just having a fellowship. There's no form and no fashion. We're just people that by God's grace, he chose, he elected, he called out. And now he, 
He he redeemed us by his hand, and now he holds us by his hand, and he guides us by that same hand. So let's just turn to him. He's the only one in this life's journey that we can have confidence in. So I like to, I'm trying to think if I have any announcements. I don't think I do, so we'll just go right to the word. I think Brother Chad's okay. I hope he's, I hope he is. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's just I'm already, yeah, so. Now, Brother Ben, right? You don't make me forget about them announcements. I just completely fail. Brother, Pat, Brother Chad's okay, right, Sister Angie? He's fine. He'll be here on Friday, Lord willing. I'm sorry. And uh, we're all looking forward to our pastor and Brother Elia coming back. I've heard good things. So if you don't mind, let's just, let's just continue. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus 33, 7. Exodus 33, 7. Um... And I heard you've been standing for a while, so I'll let you sit in a minute. <laughs> Little lengthy portion here, but if you could just um, enter into this thought with me. Exodus 33, 7. And Moses took the temple and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone that sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle that the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshiped, every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again, into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found... and also found grace in my sight. Now therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight, and consider consider this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence will go with thee, and I will give you rest. You may be seated. Bit of a lengthy reading. I kind of stumbled across it and it really struck me how, um, how God, <laughs> Moses didn't know who was going to go with him. And God had to remind him, I want to go with you, Moses. <laughs> I'd like to be the one. The Bible says, uh, I think there's a scripture, it says, uh, you know, where, uh, where is the place of my dwelling, but a body hast thou prepared for me, right? God was looking for a place of rest, and so are we. And I, there's a lot in this, and I kept praying about it, and I wanted to go some ways with this, and I just seemingly can't, could not. I kept getting a blocked door, but I kept getting one strong thing. And so I'm, I, I don't believe I'm prone to fanaticism by any means, but I, I do believe sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. I think if we l- remove inspiration and Holy Ghost leadership from the Church of the Living God, we just have a lot of formally educated individuals, and we uh, separate ourselves from the supernatural, then there's something wrong with us, each and every one of us. But I have a, um, a direction, and I'm nervous because it's all he gave me. And I stared at this computer for hours 
and I just know I have a direction, and I feel as confident as I've ever felt confident in my life that this is a direction. He gave me a scripture. Now, beyond that, I have no idea. <laughs> is that okay? So, I'd like you to turn to Matthew's 11, verse 28. And before we read it, I was praying, and I don't think a minister, I don't think anybody that loves the Lord and loves God's people, as they mature in the Lord, do they ever really, do they come to a point where they really care of impressing anybody? I don't think impressing anybody is really an attribute of a Holy Ghost-filled man or woman. Um, if the greatest among us made of himself of no reputation and his, his ministry continues in the bride of Jesus Christ, I believe a non-reputation -reputa type wife is what he will find. And so when I come to speak, and you all know me enough by now, it, you know what, I love following Brother Noel because we all know Brother Noel is Brother Noel and we love that about him. I love that about him. I told him, I said, Brother Noel, you carry just the right vitamin for me, brother. I can be just what I am by the grace of God. I can't be nothing that I ain't. We don't have to imitate. We don't have to be like anybody else. I think it was choice stones, and each one is unique, and they all have their place, and nobody fills that gap but that stone, no matter how strangely cut they are. And I love Brother Noel. He can let you relax in your skin. <laughs> and uh, so coming here tonight, I just felt a w probably way more relaxed than I should. Um, because I just was so encouraged by his ministry. And I, and I told him, I said, I just so love a five-fold ministry. I appreciate a five-fold ministry. In this day, in this hour, when so many people don't want a five-fold ministry, here I am standing over here, and I love it. I love how God can take a, a simple man who makes mistakes and can be honest about it, who's fallible, but yet God can still use that man to speak words of eternal life, and he does it over and over. It's a true paradox that God hid himself right in the paradox. That this man can make mistakes, and yet it's every bit God when he speaks. And he can still make mistakes. It doesn't mean everything he says is right. Sometimes a man may say something wrong, but you watch the attributes of a man, he can come back and be a real Holy Ghost-filled man and make it right. If you question me on that, you haven't listened to the prophet of God. Brother Branham said, God corrected me. I shouldn't have been calling them Rickies and Rickettas. He said, God stopped me. I was calling out a man's name. He said, I never should have done it. He just checked me. I did wrong. So do Holy Ghost-filled men make mistakes? Oh, yeah. Sure they do. But because they're Holy Ghost-filled men, they go make it right. They make things right. And so I was, it's just so interesting, and I so love to see that wave sheet that's been waved before me. It lets me relax. And it helps me be just what God made me. And so when I, when I talked to Brother Noel, I got a chance to go over to Brother Jeremy's and talk to him for a little bit. And he just, you light up in his presence. Because I told him, I said, Brother, I love it. A mature ministry and a mature people can say, you know what, Brother Noel, you brought vitamin A today, and that's what I needed. Brother Chad will bring vitamin C. Brother Ben, vitamin B. <laughs> Brother Kyle, vitamin K, you know. <laughs> and there's enough maturity in each of us and in you to realize there's nothing wrong. He didn't have to carry vitamin A. He didn't have to carry vitamin B. He could just carry the vitamin he needed to carry because the sheep needed that vitamin. That's just what they needed. It was the right thing. It was the right word said in the right way. And only he could say it just that way. And so as time goes on, I think the ideas of one great big man get very little. And realizing that the ministry of God spread forth through a five-fold ministry of diverse characters becomes something of a very precious thing in our sight. And even sometimes the most calmly pieces and the most rejected ones seem to sometimes do so much very so much for you as time goes on. And so, I just got way off subject. So I, 
oh, like I told you, I had this direction. And so I'm like, Lord, you've given me this direction, you've given me this scripture, and if I told you how much he vindicated for this to me, you really truly would think I was a fanatic. But even it got to the point my wife said, oh my goodness, look, it's here too. Like she was noticing, I had shared with her this scripture, and it was everywhere, like everywhere. It, to the point where like, oh. <laughs> like, okay, I'll give you a little sign over. You can just really think I'm a fanatic, because I don't mind. Um, Brother Ben, you ever pray and say, Lord, if you just give me a sign, what direction to go, I'll go, I'll go. You ever pray like that? Lord, if I just knew, just show me. Write it in the skies. So you ready? I was praying for this service, and I was praying for you. And I tried to explain it to my daughters. It's, it's something strange. You know, we all have our own ways, I guess, of preparing. I get to thinking about you. It's weird, because Brother Branham said, if you don't care for the people, you can never help them. And so you get to, like, you get a feeling for you. And I, I'm probably letting, letting you in on something. You, I don't know I should tell you. But it's just for me, and no one's ever told me this, but it's just something I realized. And I, and I notice it with the youth, too. I get to get in a feeling for the youth. It's like I have to um, get out of my own way for a moment. And then I get to thinking about y'all. Different faces come in my mind, and that's how I begin, when I get to try to relax myself and get out of the way. And, you, and I start thinking about the congregation. And I start thinking about the, the young people and the old people and the married people and the single people. And I get to thinking about you and it helps me relax. And that sometimes it, it just gets you to a point you get to, you get to feeling like now I can, I, I can intercede for them. I can go to the Lord for them because I can feel what they're feeling. That make, made no sense to anybody. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't even have told you that. But it starts with me having to have a feeling for y'all before I feel like I can help you. And then it helps me relax. And then as I relax, I start to say, Lord, what, 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 what would you want me to say? I don't know. You know, it's not like a minister's like got all these sermons ready to go. And he's like, hey, I'm firing this one off, you know. It's like, you could give me two years to prepare and I promise you I will have no idea what to say, <laughs> even probably when I'm standing there like now. It, it, it doesn't matter for me, you know. I don't have the gifts that other brothers could have. I'm like, give me a preach on this subject. Man, they go like, oh, shit. I can't even remember what I'm going to say even after I study a subject usually. I <laughs> told my wife, when inspiration is there, I can go for hours. And after it's gone, I couldn't tell you my middle name sometimes. It's strange how that works. But it's just a reality. Am I helping you be more comfortable in your skin for a moment? And so... Uh, as I began to think that through, that scripture, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, I'm meek and lowly in heart, and that ye shall find rest for your souls. So that scripture kept coming to my mind as I'm starting to prepare on Saturday morning. And you know, I'm like, Lord, well, I don't know, wish I knew what direction. And I'm thinking of that scripture and I look up and on a billboard, is written, come unto me, all ye that are weary, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's obvious. That's too obvious. No way God would work that way, right? <laughs> that, that's too easy because then if I look for this all the time, I'll be looking for every billboard in Lima saying, what's the scripture verse I'm going to preach on next week? You know, it's, <laughs> but you know, it doesn't work that way. You know, it really doesn't. But before God, he knows. He'll know, I'll answer on the day of judgment. He knows that that scripture was on my mind. I look up, there's the scripture. And I'm like, wow, that's odd. <laughs> then I come back here and I'm talking to Brother Noel. And Brother Noel, right before service, just to check on him, and he's sitting there and he goes, you know, he said, Lord, change my subject. He said, I was driving Saturday morning, same time I was driving. And he said, inspiration came over and I told Sister Shirley, grab a pen, I'm gonna start telling you what to write because he had to drive all day I think and he didn't have time to prepare he said I had a whole sermon prepared and I, I can't preach it the inspiration take me a different direction and he said I want to I want to speak on the a believer's position in Christ and how it brings a rest and and he said I learned some things in Habakkuk about faith and I, I want to talk about it I said well praise God brother I said kind of odd it's kind of I think the direction I'm supposed to be going for Wednesday night and then we go home, we're reading a story to my, my daughters, and we start reading this random story that we just picked up to read, calm the girls down, put them to bed. And I'm barely listening, because it's not really good. But anyhow, you know, <laughs> the kids like the story. And Carrie stops. She's like, you ain't going to believe this. And says, 
in the story, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Right, Carrie? I mean, to the point where like, it's too obvious. <laughs> Way too obvious, right? And so, that's what I feel. And so, you know, when time's gone past, men would come by inspiration and preach the word. And I began to stop and think, you know, Jesus dispatched them two by two. He said, take no thought for what you're going to say and take no purse. Don't prepare for this. You just rely upon me. And then I began to realize, you know, God has always wanted a people that just relied upon him. There has never been a time that you could look through the scriptures and find those heroes of faith that did not have to live their life in a position where their place of rest was in his presence. You will never find it. I can't find it. And then once I began to think about it, I realized, wow. Okay, let's go back to Genesis. Here's Cain's people, and then here's Seth's humble little group. God's people, Seth's people, chose an occupation, farmers and herdsmen. This occupational choice that was before them made them be reliant upon God for everything that they had need of in this life's journey, everything. Never has there been a position where God will so gift you or so in, um, I, I give you revelation or ever get you to a point where you don't need him. I mean, that's counteractive to his nature and his desire. He never wanted that kind of a people. Like what kind of a husband wants a wife that says, I truly have no need of you? Like, stay here, I like the house, keep working, but I really don't need you. That's not the wife that God ever desired. It's not the wife that he wants. He wants a wife that loves him depends upon him, trusts him. Says, Lord, you said that, I believe you'll do it. So look at Abraham. God gives Abraham a promise. And God, he, he got older, but he didn't stagger at the promise. Because God had a hero of faith here. This man's faith could not be shaken by the circumstances he found himself in. And so I began to think this through and began to realize we're living in an hour where everything is falling apart, right? This doesn't take any spiritual discernment to realize that, not one ounce. You talk to anybody on the street, and they are preparing for something really bad, either an economic collapse or a famine or a politically driven craziness of forcing some type of something somewhere. Brother Branham said nations are shaking, looking for alliances. You can't look at the news where you don't hear about some country that's doing some type of political jockeying at this moment because they're all scared out of their minds. I mean, shake yourself. I should say pinch yourself. We have arrived. Everything is shaking. Everything is falling apart. Men's hearts are failing for fear. People are having heart attacks left and right. They're scared to death. They're building bunkers. They're preparing for all kinds of things, okay? Now here's God's people. What do they do to prepare? I mean honestly, in all sincerity. Like I told you, I'm just gonna be real honest with you. I got a direction, I have a leading, I know where I'm supposed to go, so I just talk to you. What do the believers that believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, do in this situation? What do they do? I'll tell you what they don't do. They don't get afraid. They don't make economic moves to protect themselves. They don't concern themselves with what politics are going to do. They don't talk about it all the time as if that's the thing that's the most important to them in their life. There's certain things a believer doesn't do when these things are coming about. And I'll tell you, <laughs> they are preppers. We do prep, don't we? We stay in prayer. We stay in the word. 
and we walk and conduct ourselves with joy in our hearts, knowing, oh my, our redemption's just getting a little closer. My, the greatest time that we could ever be alive is approaching us. It's coming fast, and oh, this is wonderful. You know what I'm saying? But I find that this rapture is a position of the believer. And I won't go super far in this because there's a lot I'm chewing on with this, but I'm finding a very clear similarity. Brother Branham said that the rapture is a revelation. And he said this revelation is faith, and faith works by love. So it's a position that you live in. You know, Enoch just lived in a certain position in the presence of God. But so few consider that. Like, I promise you, it doesn't really matter that you're a part of this church. It doesn't matter that you are part of the right group. It doesn't matter that you think the right thoughts, that you understand the right doctrine. I'm telling you, it doesn't. But if the presence of God isn't in you and filling your very vessel and guiding you and leading you every day, everything you know means nothing. It truly means nothing. Now, that word will help you if he's at the center post of your life. Every word means something, and it has its importance, and it has its significance. But if you haven't been filled with his life, which dictates your actions and your decisions in your life, then what did it all mean anyhow? It meant nothing. It was pointless. And it wasn't a place of rest. You couldn't have a true security in that. And you know you can't, and you know you don't. And so... Can I read just some scriptures and we'll see what happens next? And I, I wanted to say, I so appreciate a sister real early this morning sent me a text and said, I'm praying for you. I felt inspired to let you know. God woke me up 4 a.m. I've been praying for you. And I said, I so appreciate Holy Ghost leadership. I so appreciate that someone can just submit themselves to do what they feel to do with not knowing all the reasons why they do it, but they just do it. And I, I think that's kind of a people God wanted, didn't he? You kind of see a pattern. Why did he send them out two by two, no personal script? Why did he cause them to go out as sheep herders and, and, and herdsmen and not think about it, right? Don't worry about it, you know? It's because they, he wanted the people to live by faith. He wanted the people and a wife that trusted him. He didn't want a people that was so concerned about trying to figure everything out so they can manage in a world that's falling apart. It's an exercise in futility, complete waste and utter waste of time and energy. And all it does is express your unbelief. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. I ask these questions of myself. But we have an American system. I mean, honestly, guys, let's think for a moment. What about our believers in Sudan, Malawi, Africa, Southern Africa? What do they do to prepare? They trust God. Then I talk to American believers, and we got to talk an economical situation. How are we going to make a move? How are we going to prepare? We should all move to Florida. They have a good governor. <laughs> right? People talk like this. That's not believers. That's, I mean, that's not how believers talk. I ain't saying you could have a temporary moment of insanity and lose your mind and start acting like the rest of the world. But let me spiritually wake you up. You've been called and elected of God for this hour. This is the greatest of hours we could have ever been on this earth. He must have had some choice soldiers that were prepared and ready for this type of an onslaught. And this amount and this, this time of great fear and, and, and uh, oh boy, unbelief. He had a people that were fearless. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God liked to put his people right up against the back of a fire. He loves to do that. He likes it to get so dark, it looks like there's no way that this, this can work out. Just to come on the scene. Just to come on the scene in the darkest of hours. So what is it to us? Why do we concern ourselves with these things? I had a man, he's not a believer, but he called me. and He called me this morning. I'm like, man, good timing. He called me, he's like, hey, should I be buying gold? <laughs> I'm like, no, who cares? I said, it's going to burn. <laughs> he said, well, maybe, yeah, 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 I know. He says, he says yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, maybe I should buy farmland. I mean, we're going to need to eat. I said, you're not getting it. You're just not getting it, my friend. 
And I wasn't a believer, so, I, you know, he's a friend, though, a good friend of mine. I says, no, I'd, hi- I'd get hidden under the rock, is what I told him. I said, I'd just find that hiding place, because um, that's the only thing that I know ain't going to be shaken. And so, you know, these things, and that's why I said, I says, all I know of is that I'm supposed to say, come unto me, all ye that are weary, heavy laden, and he'll give you the rest that you need. If you're discouraged, if you're concerned, if you're laying up at night trying to figure out how you should make a move next, let me give you words of comfort. Your father in heaven, and I don't mean to say that to be fanatical, but it is the word, is saying, come unto me and take your rest. Stop worrying, stop concerning, Stop trying to make moves to prepare. He already made all the moves. You have nothing you have to do but trust him. And if you love him, you will trust him. And your actions will determine how much you actually do. You know what I mean? So 2 Corinthians says we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And so you get to thinking about this, you realize there is a life, there is a decision, and it's not always the easier way that you make, it's not always the the, the more comfortable path that we choose in life, but you make certain, I had this and I told my wife, I says, you know, honey, I says, I said to another brother, I says, you ever think about it? I said, what cross are you picking up? Like, we're Americans, we complain about the things we shouldn't complain about. I mean, it's a reproach to us. It's, it's really something to overcome. Because you most don't bear much of a cross. Let's just be honest. We, we bear very little cross. And how can you separate suffering from the Christian life? And how will you know him? So then comes the question, would you be willing to make a harder choice for his sake? These are questions I ask me. Would you be willing to take up a cross of your own choosing? Would you be willing to choose a harder way for the glory of God and for the help to his people? You know? That's why I was, I really, like, I don't know why. Brother Jariah came, and I, I just thought to him, I says, I appreciate the sacrifice that brother made to come here early, open up everything for you all. You probably didn't even know it. He came here early. He has a family. He's got kids. He made a sacrifice for you all, because he loved you. Come here early, get things ready. Brother Franco, Sister Amy, what a sacrifice they make. Trustees, I know how hard you work, you know. So, Brother John, would never want your position. It's hot and cold at the same time, no matter what the temperature is, at all times. By the way, it's cold in here. So, (laughs) but you know what I mean? God appreciates these little sacrifices that They all make, and we all make for each other. But it's such a little thing. (laughs) God appreciates it. Brother Branham said it. No matter what you do, God appreciates it. But I just wonder, could could we make some other harder choices? Some career choices? Some family choices? Some personal choices? Like, you know you're gonna die. If God, if, if your body isn't molecules completely changed, one day you'll die. And you'll have to answer for the life that you've been given. And every gift and every decision you made is going to come up before you one of these days. And it's not a light thing. Like, don't get me wrong, I love to be encouraged. And I love to hear how wonderful we are as a people, because we are. We're his great choosing, we're his elect, and he's done so very much for us. But then sometimes it just seems like, what, what have I done for him? You know? We get so consumed with feeling good that we don't consider he wants to take rest too. 
Like, you see what I, I read. Where is the place of my dwelling? Where is the place of my rest? You know God's looking to take rest? Where is he going to find a people that he can have rest in, have complete and total, utter control over every decision that they make? Where can he find that kind of a rest? He doesn't care about this building. Like, I don't care about this building. I care about you all. But God doesn't care about the metal and the drywall and the carpets and the chairs. This is not the place of his dwelling. Brother Brian, but no, uh, sorry, another tall man. <laughs> Brother Joe, <laughs> Brother Brian, Brother Joe, that's his interest. Man, if I could just get that tabernacle, that's what I want. That's the place of my dwelling, right? Brother Donovan, man, I've been working on him for a long time. That's what I want. I don't want a name. I don't want a building. I don't want anything like that. I was looking for one individual. That could be a total, sold-out, surrendered individual. Oh, if I could just get that man right there. That's all I was looking for. You know? That sister. Boy, if I could just get her to realize how precious she is to me. Don't forget, the thoughts of God to you are more than the sand that is upon the sea. So I think he's had some thoughts about you. I think he's been longing for a very long time and going to Great Lakes efforts to get you into a position that he could have full preeminences. But remember, being a perfect gentleman, he'll never take them. Had this thought where he says, speak the truth in love. And it struck me the other day, I shared it with a brother. I says, you know, God, that, that mystery that God wanted to have the preeminences in a bride was so precious to him, he held on to it for thousands of years and didn't let it out. You ever think, why? Brother Bam said the devil could do great damage with it if he did. So it was so precious to him to hide this mystery that Christ in you was his ultimate desire that he hid it. And knowing that God wanted the preeminences in his bride, realizing that he can never force this decision upon her because he built you with free moral agency, you have to make a choice. What would happen, and I shared, oh, I think it was Brother Wesley or a couple brothers, if I told you I'm looking for a wife and she better be this tall, she better be able to cook this pie, she better be able to do this amount of laundry within a four-hour period, <laughs> She better be able to cook, she better be able to clean, she better do this, she better hug me three times a day, send me a text, tell me that she loves me, tells me all these things, right? Okay, now, say my wife finds that out, and she does all of it, because I had a little thread at the bottom, because if she don't, I will put her away. Now, she could do all those things, but is she doing them because she wants to? No, it's out of fear. She's afraid if she doesn't, she's out. You think God wants a bride that serves him out of fear? Not at all. It doesn't even fit his nature. It's contradictory to his nature. And so if you don't speak the truth in love, but you speak the truth anyhow, is it justified? No, not justified. The ends cannot justify the means when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I began to chew on these things. I said, so well, now, this is an interesting thought. What if we do all the right things for all the wrong reasons? Then if we do all the right things for all the wrong reasons, then God's purpose is still not fulfilled in his bride. So you could have a dynamic ministry, phenomenal ministry, that people feel compelled and pressured into conforming to a certain type of life and it's not what God wanted. Again, doing all the right things, absolutely all of the wrong reasons, and you have spoiled the entire purpose that God had purposed in his heart for his people. God wanted preeminence. God wanted you to be willing to lay down your life so he could have the preeminences to make every decision for you. And that's a shocking thought. He's that concerned? Yep. And it's so rare to find. So hard to find. A people that could be that surrendered to God that the only thing they concern themselves with is doing his will. You know, Brother Branham says in conferences, he says God called himself to a conference. <laughs> Strange way of stating this. He said in every way he was a man. 
He thought like a man. He felt like a man. He had temptations like a man. But he was also God. And he says, and the father asked him, will you go to that cross? Will you make this your decision? And he said he wrestled it out in this conference with God. And he said, I will. I'll do it. So there in the garden of Gethsemane, he chose a cross where he laid down his will for the will of the Father. He said, not my will, thine will be done. And he continued on. And so this question I've had of myself, should I call myself to a conference? Because I find in me both good and evil. You find in you both very much flesh and yet very much God. This is a mystery that's been unveiled to us that we actually can relate with that we know there's an aspect of you that's not God. And you know it, and I know it. (laughs) But there's very much an aspect of you that is. Very much. And I know it, and you know it. And that's why I appreciate so much about the various body, the the various gifts that are in the body, because I can recognize. And I've had conversations with close brothers that know me very well, and they know there's times when that's just Kyle talking. Frustrated, down, concerned, worried. And then there's times when God speaks. And it's totally different. And then so I find myself, have we really come to that time in this Omega ministry where God continues to work and to fulfill his great desire and fulfill those things that he left undone for his body to be fulfilled? Has he put us back in the position of the garden where we're calling ourselves to a conference and saying, "Mm, what cross did I pick up today? How can I give him this preeminence? How can he take his rest so that I can take mine? You know, when Enoch took the rapture, it wasn't like Enoch did this all alone. He was with somebody. He was walking with the Lord and he took a rapture. You know, when Brother Branham's body changed and he became a young man, it wasn't because he was alone. He was in the presence of the right person. The presence of the right person asked him a question and said, you wanna walk with me? He said, Lord, be the greatest desire of my life, right? Before then, he had to make a decision. And Lord had to reveal to him, you walk with too many. If you're going to walk with me, you walk alone from this point on. And so much of us, we just don't, we know God calls us to those types. I could tell you, I just talked to you like we're sitting at the table, right? Is that okay? And we know sometimes God calls us like that. He whispers something to us. He says, hey, if you're going to walk with me, you got to give that up. If you're going to walk with me, you can't keep doing that. If you're going to walk with me, you have to separate. Why do you think Moses, God had to take, or Moses had to take the tabernacle outside of the camp to meet with God? There comes a point in time where it's you and you only, and it's him and him only. And that is your place of rest. That is his greatest desire, and I think that's the rapture. I believe that that's the rapture, a place of rest, a hiding place in him. You know what I mean? We are in rapture cycle. I get it. I know to wit, the change in the body is the fullness of redemption. But I'm looking at this rest and I'm realizing the earnest of my redemption was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit guidance is leading me back behind the veil where the curtain can be shut and I'm with him alone. Then let the world do whatever it's going to do. Let it blow up. Let Russia drop bombs and let the economies of the world collapse. What do I care? I've been shut in. I'm shut in. I'm closed in. And it's just joy bells ringing for me. Because I know the one I put my confidence in, he's promised I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I'll lead you. I'll guide you. Don't you ever worry. What do I have to worry about? I'm in the palm of his hand. So a believer's position in Christ, this true place of rest, He says, take my yoke upon you. Yoke yourself. That means join yourself with me. But remember, I'm meek and I'm lowly. You know, God will never change in that nature. He's not all of a sudden not ever going to be meek. We're not going to get to heaven and realize he changes his mask and he's not meek any longer. He is and will for always be a meek and gentle lamb. That's what makes him so great. He's so great he can make himself simple. And that's why I think now we're at this point in time, the bride has some decisions to make. Can she become this simple? Can she become this lowly? Can she not concern herself with just keeping up for him? 
Brother Branham said, and why are the people so tossed about? He said, the Christian faith is solidly based on rest. That's it. Christian is not tossed about. A Christian doesn't run from place to place. A Christian doesn't fuss and fume and worry about things. A Christian's at rest. It's all over for him. It was all finished for the believer on Calvary. It's all over. He says, but I find there's two types of Christians. He says, not types, phases. He says this, <clears throat> he says, um, oh, did I just leave it? No. He says, these two types of Christians seem strange. He said, I would say it's really two types or two phases would be a better use of the word. Not types, two phases. Some Christianities, two phases to it. One of them, it's intellectual. It's a mental conception of God, uh, God, of what God has said in his word and of Jesus Christ by the way of knowledge. And the other is experience, that God has given the man in his heart. The one intellectually, he's hungering and feasting on God, but his feasts just don't hold out. The other one seems to have victory all the time. There's nothing that bothers him. He's as solid and anchored as there can be. No trials and no storms can bother them at all. That's the kind of Christian I want to be. I may not have all the answers and I may not know all the mysteries, but I know what God did in my heart. And by the grace of God, I'm learning obedience through much suffering. And I want that experience to continue to grow and grow and I want him to have the preeminence more and more. Can I continue? Just sitting around the table. Let me tell you something. When you're worshiping God in spirit and truth, when it becomes custom for you to do it because you think you ought to, because you think that if I don't shout or don't jump up and down or I don't dance or the neighbor's going to think that I'm backslid, then you are drinking from stagnated stream. Until it fills your every fiber, until the Holy Spirit itself is bubbling in you, I don't care whether the music is playing, whether they're playing near my God to thee or whatever, the Holy Spirit is still ringing out joy bells in your heart. He's still satisfying that God that satisfies the portion. Anything else but that and you're done. You might speak with tongues of men and angels. You might give all your goods to the poor. You might prophesy, you might have knowledge, and you may understand all the mysteries and all things. You have become tinkling. You have become nothing. You are, until that satisfying something can come in there and quench that thirst. Like he said, my soul thirsts for the living God, like the heart is panting after the water brook. Unless I can find it, I will perish. You will get hungrier for God. You will, you will get hungering for God. Something is going to take place. The Holy Spirit will lead you to that great fountain of God, obviously to satisfy the thirst, right? There's just something about God. When he comes into the individual, he calms you down. That was his purpose, right? When he, the spirit of, uh, of truth, has come, when truth is made known and he's speaking to you and you know he's leading you, how could you not rest? How could you not rest when you see him you look back through life and you see the decisions you made and you look how many things he brought you through. How do you not rest? My, he knows the end and the beginning like David could say. He knows my goings forth and my comings from. He knows if I ascended up into heaven, he's there. If I go down to hell, he's there. He's with me, David's saying. No matter where I go, he's with me. So David could be at rest and he could write the 27th Psalm. And the prophet of God to this age could come back and pick it up and say, there you go. There's your rapture. This man has hidden himself, cleft behind the rock. What does he care if wars and rumors of wars and enemies and everybody rejects him and all manner of evil is surrounding him? What does he care? He's walking with the king. What does it matter? He says, a momentary consideration of church history will prove how accurate that this thought is that in the dark ages, the word was almost entirely lost to a people. But God sent forth Luther with the word and the Lutherans spoke for God. But they organized and again, the pure word was lost for organization 
and an organization tends towards dogma and creeds and not simple word, and they could just no longer speak for God. And so, you know what dogma means? A set of commonly held truths. It's just all it means. A set of commonly held truths is dogma. But I certainly hope you're not a believer because you're just walking with commonly held truths. I pray and I believe with all my heart that the prophet of God came to fulfill one purpose, which he said, that was to join God and man again. His purpose wasn't to build a church. His purpose was not to draw people to himself. His purpose was to see to it that God and man could become one again. That was the purpose, that was the objective. That's the purpose of the ministry. I think that's the purpose of any believer is they wanna see God and man join. When you witness to somebody, you're not there to impress them with what you know. You have a heart for the man. You want to see that man get back in his position as a son of God restored to his father, that he could walk like, like a man that came from a kingdom somewhere else. You know what I mean? Brother Branham says this, the key to success was dividing and conquering. <clears throat> he says, now we know that the wounded head of pagan the, of the pagan empire, this great political world power, his head rose up again, this Roman Catholic spiritual empire. Now watch it carefully. What did political pagan Rome do that was the basis for her success? She divided and conquered. That was the seed of Rome to divide and conquer. Now her iron teeth devout, tore and devour. Whom she tore and devoured, they could not rise again. The same iron teeth remained in her when she arose as the false church. Her policies have always remained the same, divide and conquer. This is Nicolaitanism, and God hates it. Absolutely, utterly hates it. What did the devil do in the beginning? He came to Eve and separated her from the simple word that she had confidence in. And when he said, Brother Bram said they only had a few words to keep. And when the devil could come in and create in her an insecurity, an insecurity to thirst for something than what God had given her, he could slip in the trap. And so, do you think we're living in insecure times? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think the devil has given up on trying to trip you up? Oh, no. No, no. He'll try to create an insecurity so he can slip in a little lie, get you to believe something that draws you away from a simple, humble faith in a simple, pure word that God never fails and he always keeps his word. Like, I don't know how to make it any more simple. Come unto me, I'll give you rest. But you won't do that if you don't believe it. But if you do believe it, you will. And you'll yoke yourself with this simple, humble word You'll take an approach that's meek and lowly, and you'll follow him wherever he goes. And along the way, he will never force you, but he'll give you opportunities to make some very hard decisions. That you could pick up your cross and follow him by your own choosing. All right? Because thou hast walked in thine own choosing. Thou hast chosen the harder way, right? You walked in your own choosing, and a great portion of heaven awaits thee, right? And I got to thinking this, you know, remember Brother Branham went behind the veil? I'm sorry, it's okay, still okay, right? You can quiet on me, but. Now, if at the dinner table, sometimes they speak back, so before long. <laughs> Brother Branham goes behind the veil. And when he gets behind the veil, he says, I want to see Jesus. And he says, oh, he'll come to you. You are a leader. He says, oh. He says, uh, will he come to Paul? He said, oh, yes, he'll come to Paul. He said, well, good. I preached exactly what Paul preached. What did the people say? All of them? All of them with one voice said one thing. We are resting on that. We, we are resting. We're not striving. We're not laboring. We are resting in this word that you preached was the truth. And we've put our souls and we've yoked with it and we go with it wherever it leads us to go. We bear it with honor. You know what I mean? So I'd ask you, are you resting? 
Are you laboring? Are you fearful or are you concerned? Are you just resting in the palm of his hand, realizing I've been watching over you every day of your life? I've been thinking about you constantly. I know exactly where you are. I know exactly where you've been. I know exactly where you're going. I've been preparing you for your own decision from before the foundation of the world where you would give me a place of rest so that you could take yours. You know what I mean? Brother Branham makes the comment, and you all know this. He said, all hell is against this mystery. He said, it goes right by them and they don't recognize it until it's gone and it only picks up a predestinated seed that God has predestinated from before the foundation of the world. The same thing came through in the days of Noah and the same thing came through in the days of Moses, Elijah, and the days of the prophets and of Jesus and down to this very own hour, the pregnated person with the seed of God and the word in there manifesting itself, not manufacturing anything, not trying to be a believer, not trying to live a Christian life. Humbly believing, accepting the word, and it's producing its own life. Nothing I am doing, nothing you ever have to do. You just believe it, you accept it, and it produces its own life. Every seed brings forth of its own kind. What does it have to do? Nothing. All the seed does is really drink in water, and it pushes out a life. That's all it's ever had to do. He says, not say my church, now my church, your church has nothing to do with it. This is an individual, one person, and all hell is against this teaching. All hell is against this truth, but it is the truth. Jesus never did say, now Peter, James, you and John, the rest of you. No, you've got the revelation, and the whole church is, and the whole church is saved. No. It was to him personally, and I say unto thee, not to them, to thee thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. And the word Peter means little stone, or a confessed one, and or a separated one. So all hell was against you as an individual, making him your place of rest. Man, you could do a lot of good things for God, but don't give him preeminence. My goodness, that's the one thing. Like, Go to church every Wednesday night, or go, to every, or go to every meeting and sing very loudly, but do not give him preeminence. You realize that's the thing that the devil doesn't want you to do. Do it all else. Say amen to everything, but just keep a couple of decisions for yourself. There's a couple little spots. This is mine. I did, now this is me. That I got to hold on to this. That's all it takes, guys. Just disbelieve one word. What's all hell against? The individual giving him preeminences over every decision. And you cannot do it unless you love him because that love will produce a confidence and that confidence will produce a faith and that faith will produce a rapture and a place of rest for the individual. Amazing, ain't it? Really something to think about. So I told you my direction. That's all the notes I have. What else am I going to do? I can say, Brother Ben, it's your turn. <laughs> but I believe I said what I, I was supposed to say. I'm just going to see if I have anything else here that I could. No. No, I think that's it, everyone. Let me think. One more. Just found it. <laughs> Brother Ben says about Jesus. He said, there come another Adam, which was Christ. Never a one like him. Somebody says he, is, he, he wasn't God, but his uniqueness proved he was God. There never was a creature like him. He lived in a world to himself. He was born outside of the realm of the natural sinful man. Hallelujah, he was the creator himself, made flesh. Who could ever stand where he stood? I think that's a question. Who could ever stand where he stood? Who could ever talk like he talked? Who could ever say the things that he said? Who could ever do the things that he had done? His uniqueness proved that he was God. There wasn't a prophet or nothing else could do what he had done. Who could call the dead back to the grave? Who could stop the skies and do anything he wanted to? He was God. Who could ever stand in his place? 
what could he be but the perfect immortal God in flesh that dwelt among us? Nothing ever compared with him. He lived in a world all to himself. And this life, this life of Jesus, if it ever puts forth another body of believers, it will bear the same fruit that the first one did. So my question, who can do what he did? If that vine puts forth another branch, that vine, the fruit of that vine will do the exact same thing he did. It will look at any obstacle in any situation and say, not my will, but my Father's will be done. I believe the potentials are there. It's just decision time. God is known in simplicity and the revelation of Jesus Christ to the most illiterate person. Don't that make you say amen? amen. Illiterate. See, not your theology, but a revelation of Jesus Christ. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. And no other rocks are accepted, and no anything else is accepted. No other Roman rock, Protestant rock, or other school, no nothing. But exactly the revelation of Jesus Christ through a new birth. He's born in there, and he injects his own life, and your life is gone. And the life of Christ is projecting itself through you with preeminences. To the people that they see the very life and works and signs and wonders that he did, is doing the very same thing through you. Outside of that, the rest is not even called into it. God's great revelation is unfolding. By lack of this revelation is why we have so many divisions among us and so much mockery and so much division. It is because people lack that revelation. See, they lack that revelation. So here's, here's a little tidbit. Um, the Bible says one man keepeth a day as unto the Lord and another doesn't keep a day as unto the Lord. You know that scripture? And another one, he eateth meat as unto the Lord, but this other one, he doesn't eateth meat as unto the Lord. So let me ask you a question. Should we do like some of the disciples did that said, hey Lord, um, they're preaching, but they're not with our group. We should call down fire from heaven and burn them up. And Jesus said, what spirit's on you? Leave them alone. Let them go. Just let them go. If they're not against us, they're for us. Just let them go, you know? And so these things, you know, we're not, um, we're not okay because we believe a certain doctrine, you know? Sometimes people don't understand things. I certainly don't understand a lot of things. I'm learning every day, and the more I know, the more I know I don't know. <laughs> And I remember to realize I'm just a canary brain and I only know what he tells me anyhow. So at the end of the day, I might as well just serve God with the best I know how. And I better leave everybody else alone because they're trying to serve God the best they know how. And if I could be a help to them, I'll try to be a help and an example in any way I can. But outside of that, who am I to tell them? <laughs> you know what I mean? In some situ certain situations like that, you've had to go back and I've had to go back and say, hmm, you know what? God bless them anyhow. And I mean it sincerely. God help them. God bless them because they know I know I need my help too. Help me to express. Help me to make these hard decisions in my life. I don't want to be one that's just rallying around a group of people that we, we've all claimed to believe a certain set of dogmas, a certain set of truths, and now I find confidence because I'm a part of the right group. That's insecurity. The only security I'll ever have is when Jesus Christ is personally made known to me in this revelation, and I begin to express that revelation, not of my own will, but because the life that's in me is expressing itself. And then I can have a confidence. Will you stand, and musicians, will you come? I told you I go until I run out of things to say, and I ran out of things to say. Do you understand what I was saying, though? You understand the direction? All I had was a direction for you all. But I do believe it was of God. I believe it was his grace to us. Help us not to get, help us to understand what his great desire was. A rest, a real rest in an individual and understand where I get my rest. I get my rest in doing the will of God. I don't get my rest from knowing something. I get my rest from being in his presence. In his presence is where I'm wanting to be and to live. I don't want to go in and out of that one. I believe the Shekinah glory, the curtain shut behind him and shut him in behind it. 
and he was shut in behind the veil with God. And that's where God wanted him, and that's where the man wanted to be. And that's where I want to be, and that's where I all want us to be. You all want to be there? Some decisions to be made, but I'm so thankful that we have an almighty God that would be so kind and so concerning of us to just say, why don't you just come and take some rest? That, to me, is just a wonderful thing. In the hour in which we're living, when there's weariness and distractions and concern and fear all around, your father whispers, hey, come relax. <laughs> just, just relax right here under my presence, in my presence. Don't worry. Everything is fine. Amen? Let's just have a word of prayer here. Heavenly Father, we just come before you. Lord, we always are appreciative of the word that you've given us and, Lord, of your presence. It's so simple sometimes, but you said it would be. You said it'd be so simple that a fool should not err in. Sometimes in our own messed up ways, we overcomplicate things. We overcomplicate you. That's what made you so great was because you could become so simple. And men tends to do this. And it's our, even our own fallen nature that begins to try to make you something greater than what you're trying to be simple for the people. What a great God you really truly are. Lord, and I just pray that you would help each and every one of us to understand the simplicity that is found in trusting you. It's not him that willeth or him that runneth, it was God that showed us mercy. And Lord, each and every one of us could lift up our hands, bow our heads and say, Lord, where would I be if you wouldn't have come towards me? It wasn't us pressing towards you. <laughs> what could we do in, of ourselves? We can't add one inch to our stature, nor could we add one hair to our head, the Bible says. We can do nothing. How can we take a, a complete and utter body change? Unless we're just taking a step day by day, walking in your presence with your word. And Lord, you're bidding us to come to do that. What an honor it is to each and every one of us. Father, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you'd give us all wisdom. I pray that you would give us all of your nature and of your life. Father, so that the things that you left undone for this day and this age and for the fulfillment of your body could be done in each and every one of us for the glory of God and not our own. Lord, may things be done that you had in the back parts of your mind that you wanted to see accomplished be done in the simplicity of a housewife, simplicity of a, a farmer, of a mechanic, making you their, their, their purpose in life, making you their giving you the preeminences and decisions made and directions taken. Lord, we so appreciate it, and I appreciate your word so very, very much. And Lord, I just pray that you'd watch over our pastor, Brother Elia, as they'll be traveling home. Lord, I pray that when they get home, you'll give them rest for their natural bodies, Father. Lord, they've, they've went because of love for you and for your people and made a great sacrifice and and no doubt the people appreciate it, and we appreciate that, that they've done that for them. But Lord, we just pray that you'd watch over them, keep them safe, and strengthen their bodies for the services to come. And Father, I just pray for everyone that's here. Lord, will you just continue to walk with us? And Lord, we sure love you. What could we say more than we love you? Search our hearts like David said. If there be anything wicked in us, Father, will you help to get it out of our lives? We don't want it there. We know that we have this hybrid flesh, this body of flesh, we fight it every day. But Father, you said greater is he that's in me than he that is in this world. So Father, we just submit, believing you, that you keep your word. Finish the work, Lord, that you began in each of our lives and express the great mystery that you had. We sure love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. Have a song, brother. There's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree, and he whispers, draw
demons come and lonely days without the sun if through sorrow more like you I'll be called oh whatever it takes to draw closer to you Lord that's what I'll be willing to do and Sunshine for rain, comfort for pain. That's what I'll be willing to do. For whatever it takes for my. Sunshine for rain, comfort for pain. That's what I'll be willing to do. For whatever it takes for my. Bye.